welcome to Little Decisions, Athens' only podcast about kindness, connection, and community. My name is Victoria, Victoria Cooper, and me? I'm obsessed with pineapples. I believe them to be welcoming and kind, but also unique, which is exactly how I try to make this podcast. For today's audio adventure, we are discussing the power of kindness when you discover your spark. Discover your spark, like all episodes, is meant to be a call to action. How? Well, you'll have to stay tuned to find out. But at first, a bit of light housekeeping, if you please. For this week's housekeeping, I wanted to share a little teaser about upcoming interviews I will be releasing for the month of October. Upcoming interviews include one with an underground filmmaker, another with Athens' first poet laureate, and then one with the Spike Squad from UGA, just to name a few. I also have an interview soon with Athens' own Pink Flamingo. And those are just the interviews I have coming up. That doesn't include the interviews I've already completed, including with Allison Always, David Matthews Morgan, Matt Brewster, Nicole Black, just to name a few. Tracy Adkins? Is there someone in particular you want me to interview? Just reach out on social media, at Little Decisions Podcast. Speaking of social media, we recently celebrated having over 2,000 followers on Instagram. I'm currently planning a huge giveaway on Instagram for November, so stay tuned for more on that. And we will call that clean, because that's housekeeping. For this week's Words Matter, I want to talk about discovery. To discover your spark, you need to understand first what activities feed your soul, and which ones do the exact opposite. To discover your spark through kindness is to believe in what you're doing, to believe in it for yourself. To discover your spark is to be kind to your authentic self by both acknowledging and feeding all the parts of you all of them. To discover your spark, you need to understand the flame, which only requires a little bit of truth from you. It's okay if you believe you haven't discovered your spark yet. We are all at different stages. Maybe you are in the phoenix stage of things, and rebirth is coming. If you haven't yet discovered your spark, but you want to start, I suggest you look at what you don't like first. Maybe a pattern will emerge of things that take from you to help you make a new list, a list of things that feed you. Plus, it's sometimes easier to know what you don't like than to remember what you do. To discover your spark is a constant process, one that must be met with kindness and patience. You see, your spark will change from day to day, sometimes hour to hour. Don't be discouraged by this. Instead, embrace it and make the little decision every day to discover what inspires you, what motivates you, what gets you out of bed that day. For that, that is your spark. For today, I discovered my spark and it's spreading kindness in my community and building connections from that kindness. Later in this episode, I'll interview Jack Eisenman, who discovered his spark in poetry. And that's Words Matter. Instead of quotes this week, I offer you several affirmations related to kindness and discovering your spark. These are brought to you by Nicole Black, Kid Kindness Kindred Spirit. I've actually already sat down for an interview with Nicole, and I can't wait to share it in the coming weeks. In the meantime, here are your kindness affirmations for this week. Pick one and repeat it several times throughout the day, whenever you have a few free seconds, maybe at a stop sign, or waiting in the carpool. Here are your kindness affirmations. 1. I choose kindness. I choose kindness. I choose kindness. Two, I act with kindness. I act with kindness. I act with kindness. Three, I say my words in a kind way. I say my words in a kind way. I say my words in a kind way. way. Number four. I am mindful of other people and their feelings. I am mindful of other people and their feelings. I am mindful of other people and their feelings. And five, I want to be kind more often. I want to be kind more often. I want to be kind more often. You can find more kindness affirmations and many more resources by checking out Nicole Black of Coffee and Carpool, Raising Kind Kids, Teaching Kind Kids. And that's affirmations. 
For this week's In the News, I have two stories. Our first news story is one that exemplifies kindness, connection, and community. This story from the Good News Network says, quote, A new study from the University of British Columbia finds that performing small acts of kindness can help students' health and well-being, thanks to Dr. John Tyler Binfei and Dr. Sally Stewart, who published a study about the inclusion of kindness in an undergraduate class and how it impacted students. They said, quote, We know being kind yields a number of well-being benefits, such as stress reduction, happiness, and peer acceptance, and we know mental health impacts learning, said Dr. Binfei. The participants completed 353 kind acts. Students that completed at least three of the five planned acts of kindness self-reported significantly higher scores of in-person kindness and peer connectedness. The participants completed 353 kind acts. Students that completed at least three of the five planned acts of kindness self-reported significantly higher scores of in-person kindness and peer connectedness, end quote. This next story is also one that hits on all three themes of this podcast. This story is from the blog of kindnesschampions.com. It's about two Missouri teachers who sent the following note home, quote, if your family is experiencing difficulties at home, I would like to provide additional support at school. If your child is coming to school after a difficult night, morning, or weekend, please text me, handle with care. Nothing else will be said or asked. This will let me know that your child may need extra time, patience, or help during the day. End quote. What a powerful thing to do, and what an empowering tool to have at your disposal as a parent. The article included the following quote that I just love. Quote, Kindness begins with the understanding we all struggle. End quote. Charles Glassman. For today's local kindness, I want to mention two services that are available in Athens. I will be interviewing someone involved with both of these suggestions. The first is Funkula's Art of Healing, which is affordable art and healing classes. According to their Instagram flyer, no art experience is needed. And quote, art of healing is a safe space where you can release your inner emotions and allow your subconscious to speak its truth through art, meditation, and expression. End quote. You can find them on Instagram at F-U-N-K-C-U-L-A-A-O-H. The second service I want to briefly highlight is Fig Life Coaching. I'll be releasing a full interview with life and sex coach Rachel Greb later this month, but if you're looking for fear center growth now, look no further than Fig Life Coaching. You can find Rachel doing super fun and innovative things on her Instagram page at Fig Life Coaching. And that's local kindness. Journey. I'm an idealist. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm on my way. Carl Sandburg. I walk this dream each day, a path at times dark, sometimes sunny, always alone. No signs announce my destination nor miles to get there. Perhaps it's around the next curve, maybe a 10-year trek. I have a mandate, an inward injunction to continue with a promise of reward at the finish line. I walk this dream each day, a path at times dark, sometimes sunny, always alone. For today's Kindness in Practice, I wanted to offer you some inspiration. I wanted to present an interview of someone who actively discovers their spark and chooses to share this with the world every day. To that end, I offer my interview with Jack Eisenman for today's Kindness in Practice. We started our conversation by discussing how Jack first discovered his spark with poetry. So how did you start writing poetry? Henry P. Bennett, short, stocky, we called him the bulldog. And all the students were terrified of Henry. Until that day, he came into our classroom and started quoting poetry. And oh, he was so dynamic with his uh, quoting. Uh, It was mesmerizing to me. It was almost magical. And uh, when he left our classroom, as soon as I could, I went to the library and looked up some of the poems that he had quoted to us. I credit Henry with uh, getting me started uh, liking poetry. And I read poetry, actually um, uh, wrote a few poems in high school. (laughs) Still have some of them, and they're unedited. 
We then moved on to talk about the concept of a muse and how it influences Jack's work. Trying to explain the concept of a muse is, is almost uh, like trying to define God. I don't know that we can adequately do it, but I'll give it a go. All right. Okay. Uh, the concept of a muse we can trace back to uh, Greek mythology. There were reportedly nine muses in Greek mythology, and one of them was Calliope, and Calliope was the goddess of a- epic poetry. Uh, and the, those who were writing epic poems, those long, drawn-out poems uh, in those days, would call upon Calliope, the goddess of epic poetry, to guide them and inspire them in the writing of their, of their poem. They would even use her name, her name in the poetry itself. So I guess what we could say is that the muse is the inspiration for poetry. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know how it happens. And some say there is a muse. Some say there is not a muse. Uh, but something happens when you sit down and write a poem. Uh, many times I will not have any intention of what I'm going to write about. Jack even remembers the first poems he ever heard or read. The Village Blacksmith by Longfellow. Under the spreading chestnut tree, the village smithy stands. The smith, a mighty man, was he with large and sinewy hands, and the muscles in his brawny arms stood out like iron bands. Uh, also, Little Boy Blue by Eugene Fields. Mm-hmm. Uh, the little toy dog is covered with dust, but sturdy and staunch he stands. The little tin soldier is red with rust, and the musket roll, uh, rusts in his hands. Uh, by the way, those were two that Henry P. Bennett quoted when he came into our classroom. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. So that um, uh, those were two of my earliest uh, memories of, of, of particular poems. So who and what influences Jack today? I try to read widely. I concentrate more on, on modern-day poets these days. So most of he, the, the ones I read today, like uh, Stephen Dunn, Carl Dennis, both of whom have won uh, Pulitzer Prizes for their poetry. Mary Oliver, if you haven't read any of Mary's work, you should do that if you like nature poems. Billy Collins is my favorite. I like his poetry because it's accessible. When you read a poem by Billy Collins, you understand what it's about. And I'd like to think that my poems are that way. I'll never be a Billy Collins, of course. But I think, I'd like to think that my, po- my poems are accessible. People read it. They can say, I've experienced that. Uh, or I get that, you know, maybe every once in a while, once in a great while, they'll say, wow, you know. Jack's writing space is a bona fide poet's garret. This is a sacred writing space few have seen, yet alone been invited into twice like I was. Uh, yeah, uh, I have to credit uh, Tony Talbert, who is one of the uh, members of the Poets of Winterville, uh, for turning me on to the concept of a garret. Uh, and... Um, the Garrett uh, had its origins back in the 1800s when poets of, of that day were the starving artists uh, and um, they could not afford uh, anything uh, that would be what we would consider livable nowadays. And most often they had to get uh, find a habitable attic in, in the top floor of a building. And this thing, they would, they would be uh, small, dismal, cramped, and it would usually have a sloping ceiling, just as this has a sloping ceiling here, uh, and very sparsely furnished. And uh, so, um, uh, so I got the idea that you know I wanted to have a private space. By the way, I think everybody needs to have a private space, no matter what they do. Yeah, a, a place you know a place they can go to uh, that uh, is just their own. Very few people ever go there, and uh, they can, and when they want to, they can go and do whatever they do. Uh, and in my case, writes poetry. And so this little room here uh, is, was a perfect place for me. We used it as a storage room. It's on the second floor uh, of, of this little outbuilding, uh, and it was probably built in, in the mid-1800s. Uh, and the bottom floor is my workshop. And as you just found out, in order to get up here, you have to climb a ladder. And so, wow, you know, that in itself was, it was kind of neat to mm-hmm. me. Yeah. Uh, and so um, I thought I would spend about $75 on just sprucing it up a little bit and just leave it kind of bare. And that was until my wife got a hold of it. Yep. And 
<laughs> it you, is not bare. It is not bare anymore, and uh, so we've got some amenities in here. But it is my private space, and I absolutely love it. Yeah. And I'm up here every day. While in the space, I asked Jack for a poetry reading. Please enjoy several poems from poet Jack Eisenman. Let's see here. Well, I chose this particular poem to start with. It's always hard to know how to how to start a poetry reading, and but this particular poem uh, kind of sets a tone, I think, for all the rest of the of the poets of the poems. Um, one of the things that I do every once in a while is have a preface quotation before the poem, and and that uh, quotation can come from another poet, a novel, a movie, uh, or, or any anything that strikes my fancy. And I will write the poem based on that quotation. Here, here is the preface statement. I'm an idealist. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm on my way. Carl Sandburg. The poem is titled, Journey. <laughs> I walk this dream each day. A path at times dark, sometimes sunny, always alone. No signs announce my destination nor miles to get there. Perhaps it's around the next curve, maybe a 10-year trek. I have a mandate, an inward injunction to continue with a promise of reward at the finish line. I walk this dream each day, a path at times dark, sometimes sunny, always alone. I grew up in Greenville, South Carolina, in, a, in, in the San Susie community on Bailey Street. This one is titled, Judy's Swing. The entire Bailey Street 300 block had swing envy of the girl two doors down from 319. Kids came as far away as 387 to stand in line for a one-minute float through the sky. Soaring so high, toes brushed the leaves on the lowest maple limb, which must have been 12 feet from the grass, but seemed jack and the beanstalk high. Every kid anticipated the grand climax, the jump. The jump. A leap of faith that between letting go, flying through the air, and hitting the ground, eight-year-old lives would not flash before them. That probably is a universal experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, even someone as young as you have jumped out of a swing before. Sugar-coated. This five-year-old borrowed a nickel from Mother's Purse to, for a purchase of a lifetime. Five pennies bought a bag full of candy back in those days back when I began to learn right from wrong. My small bag looked galactic, filled with Mary Janes, marshmallow bananas, wax fruit bottles, gumballs, and sweet fake cigarettes. I didn't see mother on the porch until within 15 feet of home. Too late to stash the sack. My father would not like this next poem. Uh, he was a railroader, and um, he loved steam engines. <clears throat> Omega. That day I walked the tracks, no whistle blew, no wheels rumbled, no black smoke, just weeds, rusted rails, and thoughts of men who shouldered beams, held spikes, swung hammers, built steel ribbons for eternity. Kids have such a vivid, vivid imagination, and, uh, I, and, and I guess I did too in, in, when I was young. And so uh, you will see that imagination coming through in this poem. Uh, the poem is titled, I Wonder If the Pond is Still Buried. <clears throat> Dad said it was just a rainwater-filled concrete rectangle with rounded ends. I called it the ocean. Told my classmates how tadpole porpoises wagged their tails through the surf, never once bumping into a friend. How I sailed on a boat with Captain Ahab and fell overboard when whales rammed our stick. How I saw a green snake sea monster skim below the surface with only his head above the water, and all the sailors shrieked. How dragonfly mermaids sat on barren islands and waved welcomes to passing boats. How seamen jumped ship and swam to rocks only to have the mermaids fly away. How navy seals disguised as frogs dove to the bottom in search of, mer of submarines. How at night they sat on the ocean's rock rim and told adventure tales in coded frog language. How I broke the code and listened through my bedroom window. How one day, Dad dumped dirt in the ocean. I think a lot of times we learn lessons the hard way. <clears throat> and this one's one of those. 
Bright Red. Neighborhood boys and Daisy BB guns posed lethal combinations for sparrows and jays. Hunting became daily fun, except on Sunday when religious prohibition paused such activity. I shot one bird in my kid life, a cardinal perched high, red crested male, bright red. So red feathers reflected the sun's blaze as I fired, brought him down, experienced euphoria felt neither before nor since. I yelled the words not listed in my 10 year old lexicon. Up close, plumage appeared brighter than when viewed through crosshairs. I remembered last week when I cut my finger on a piece of glass. These poems are, are from my uh, love uh, from a different point of view folder. Mm -hmm. And they do not, you will not find the word love in any of these. <clears throat> a lot of my poems have very few words. Uh, and this one has only 17 words. So don't blink. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Chocolate covered cherry. Inside the box, I wait the lid's opening, a gaze of desiring eyes, lips of sweet fate. Last night, a candle's flame flipped shadows down across your face like monkeys up to some mischief. They slid down your forehead to your nose, hopped across your cheeks and swung on strands of hair in search of treetop treasure. They cascaded down your arms, used your white-tipped nails for springboards and splashed into the evening's darkness. I pondered their mischief, wondered about the treasure. I'll be releasing my full interview with Jack Eisenman later this month, which will feature more original poems. Before we depart company today, I want to take a moment to read the most recent Apple Podcast review submitted for this podcast. It was submitted from Gonzo Riffic, and it says, quote, Thankful for Victoria Cooper. What a voice, what a personality, and what a mission to be on. Thank you, Victoria, for your kind words, your kindness, and for making this show. Athens is full of wonderful, kind people with inspiring stories, and I look forward to hearing you speak to all the stars in the classic city sky, end quote. I wanted to read that review first to thank the author for his kind words and to also draw attention to the fact that these reviews really matter to me. They're how I gauge what is working and what isn't, and some days they're what get me in front of this microphone. For a neurodivergent like me with ADHD, repetitive tasks are particularly grueling, and creating a one-person podcast certainly has many repetitive tasks. Some days, I really need kindness like Apple Podcast Reviews to get me through it. I promise to read as many as is tolerable on the air as a way of thanking you. I hope you've been met today with kindness and understanding, and if not, I hope you found some here. Now go spark more kindness with the rest of the world. I'm Victoria Cooper, and that's Little Decisions. 